perfection, something I've worked towards my entire life. As the daughter of immigrants, I understood the high stakes of failure. As a student, I slaved for straight A's. But especially as a national champion gymnast, I mastered the art of perfection. Pointed toes, perfect posture, and always the perfect position. Perfection brought with it prestige, applause, and perfect tens. And it felt great. I was a shy child, and gymnastics gave me a stage upon which I could make people proud. A platform upon which I could make the judges, coaches, and parents proud. I was good at being perfect. I was agreeable. I was hardworking. And so long as I kept my eye on the prize, my world was destined for perfection. By 2007, I had earned the title of three-time US national champion gymnast. I had diligently che checked off the boxes from state champion to regional champion to national champion to Pan American champion, and now here I was a decade later at the World Championships, the qualifiers for the ultimate prize, the 2008 Beijing Olympic Games. That day, I stood on the edge of the mat, ready to do my final routine. Everything had been perfect up to that point. But this time, as the music crescendoed, so too did the volume of expectations in my head. I suddenly became hyper aware of the judges and the faces in the crowd and the pressure to achieve a decade-long dream. They say that all it takes is a flash of doubt. And that day, doubt determined my fate. Sure, I'd been champion for three years, but on that day, I stumbled. And I ended up missing the Olympic qualifiers by a mere 0 0.25 tenths of a point. They say it hurts when your dream falls apart. But there's nothing quite like the pain the utter unfairness and inadequacy, the regret of unfulfilled potential, when you are so close, you can taste it. On that day, I believed that I was a complete failure. And I believed that nothing I had achieved up to that point mattered. If only I had done this, if only I had done that. I thought I wasn't good enough. I didn't work hard enough. I wasn't prepared enough. That is the insidious nature of perfection. Nothing is ever good enough. Enoughness has always been an elusive feeling for me. The dictionary definition of enoughness is the state of being enough, sufficiency, adequacy. But that definition, ironically, is not good enough. But just as they say that it's hard to truly understand what it means to be happy until you've experienced the depth of despair, so too it's difficult to understand the true meaning of enoughness until you have felt life in the absence of it. I finally realized that distinction just nine months ago. I was in Black Rock City in the desert. I was at Burning Man. And I had my bright red spandex on and my faux fur coat and my gold bling. And I was biking through that desert. And I stumbled upon this incredible display of art. It was this room with curved walls 
as its canvas, and there were six words on it. They said, before I die, I want to dot, dot, dot. Markers were strewn everywhere, and people had picked up these markers and written on these walls all the things they wanted before they died. There were wishes for family, for making an impact, for love. But there was one tiny inscription on a bottom left corner, and it said, Before I die, I want to make myself proud. I thought about that later that night, and I thought back to all the accomplishments that I had accumulated in effort to make myself proud, to make the other people around me proud. And I realized why this felt off. There is a distinct difference between trying to make myself proud versus being proud of myself making myself proud versus being proud of myself. And here is how I realized that distinction. In the first scenario, imagine an empty bucket. You are the empty bucket. And as you go through life, you keep filling this bucket with all the things society has told you that you need to feel fulfilled. Nice jobs, fancy cars, great apartments, fame, press, all of those things, and you keep throwing it into that bucket. But even as you go through life, for some reason you don't feel fulfilled because you are still the empty bucket. In contrast, imagine a tree, a majestic redwood tree. This tree, as it's growing, is not reaching for other trees, trying to take their fruit. Rather, it realizes that in order to grow taller and stronger, it must focus on its roots, the things that matter most. Love, nutrients, water, connection to the earth. And only when it grows tall and strong can it start bearing fruit for other people. It dawned on me suddenly that I had been living my entire life like the empty bucket. In my quest for perfection, I had measured myself completely against external metrics of success, and I had forgotten about being proud of myself simply for being me, for being on my own journey of growth. After I retired from my gymnastics career, I went to Yale, check. I graduated with honors, check. I got a fancy hedge fund job on Wall Street, check. I founded a tech company, check. I founded my company, check. And yet this entire time, I felt like I am not good enough and I have to constantly prove to the world that I am all right. And I realized that it was a never-ending rat race. No matter how much I put in my bucket, I would always be empty. So many of us walk around with this deep, paralyzing belief that we are not good enough. We achieve and achieve, and even when we reach our goals, we soon realize that success and enoughness don't come hand in hand. You would think that the people who are the perfectionists, the overachievers, the people who shouldn't have any problem feeling like enough are the ones who wouldn't have this empty bucket syndrome. But when the fear of failure drives you, Every subsequent success is not something to be celebrated. It is something that just becomes another proving ground to do more, more, more. So it's important to ask yourself, how are you complicit in creating the scenarios that you fear most? 
When I lost that Olympic qualification, I couldn't imagine not going. I was so afraid of failing, of letting my parents down, my coach down, myself down. But that was exactly what happened. The tree presents a new perspective, a choice that we can make. Rather than making ourselves proud, we can be proud of ourselves. Rather than waiting for someone or something to choose us, we must choose ourselves first. We must choose ourselves first. There is a new paradigm of enoughness, one that means sourcing self-worth from the inside and detaching it from external expectations by focusing on the roots that matter most, on love and connection, on self-care and on impact. Through this simple shift in perspective, and remember this has only happened nine months ago, from bucket to tree, I have become more confident, more grounded, a better friend, a better business leader. How I feel this enoughness shows up in how I act and how I react, how I love and how I lead. And ultimately, because I have invested in myself, so too my ability to invest in other people has grown. Today, I am the co-founder of SheWorks, a global platform that empowers over 20,000 women with the skills, resources, and mentorship so that they can build and scale successful companies. So I want to share an experience about how enoughness was put into play. Three years ago, I went to Silicon Valley for the first time to fundraise. And I remember walking into an investor meeting, and this investor goes straight over to my 35-year-old white male COO, shakes his hand, and brushes me off as his assistant. It dawned on me that for most women, it's not about the big, egregious stories we hear in the news. It's the small paper cuts that happen every single And I'll admit, these external challenges will continue to exist, but what we have control of is our internal. I realized in this new paradigm of success how these negative thought patterns were starting to influence my presence. Because in that situation back then, I remember feeling offended, overpowered, thought prove to him that I measure up. Because when we feel like we're not enough, we focus too much on the how rather than the why. We focus on how are others judging us versus why I deserve to be here. And so I had a chance to redo this situation because just six months ago, I was at yet another investor networking event and I was talking to the partner who had organized that event. But in the middle of our conversation, a man walks up abruptly, interrupts, completely ignores me. And later, I went up to him and I talked to him about my work and he sheepishly admitted that he thought that I was the assistant. And this time, instead of reacting, I thought, okay, let me take a deep breath. And I removed the focus from myself as the victim. I thought about my why, why I was meant to be there. And I realized that my duty was to show up and listen, to understand and to educate. So this time I confronted him as equals engaged him in a collaborative conversation. And because I didn't disappear, he had the opportunity to have a breakthrough. 
and he realized how he was perpetuating gender bias. And at the end of that conversation, I had a new friend and a new advocate. Many of us walk around and hold this feeling of inadequacy privately and painfully. But what this simple story shows is that enoughness or lack thereof is not private. It's public and it shows up in the way that we walk, the way that we talk, the way that we hold ourselves, inevitably the way everyone else perceives us. All driven by the simple insidious thought that maybe I'm not good enough. So, what do we do about this? How do you actually overcome this? Because it's one thing to talk about it, but it's another thing to actually take action and figure it out. So, I am a perfectionist and an overachiever, so I created a model. <laughs> I call this the ABCDs of enoughness. A is awareness. Analyze situations in which you show complicity, and it all boils down to a simple equation. The simple equation is, go back a slide, I am A, enough, or B, not enough, when in X situation. Everyone has a different X variable when they feel like they're not enough. Figure out what your X is. And then B, become curious about your behavior. Our behaviors are simply manifestations of the stories that we tell ourselves day in and day out. Once you can figure out what your triggers are, you can switch it. C, creation. Create an image of your mind as that tree, as your strongest self. How do you feel in that situation? How do your strengths show up? Bring that into your action. And finally, D, duty. Remove the focus from yourself and get out of your head. Think about why you're there and what your duty is, whether that's to educate or inspire, to motivate or just to understand. Because when you realize your duty, all that shame and insecurity will fall away because you'll realize that when you show up as a lesser version of yourself, you not only rob yourself of your own voice, you rob others of their potential to benefit from your strengths and your impact. So what is enoughness then? The most successful people realize that achieving your goals is not about what you get externally. It's about the person you become in that process. So enoughness, the true definition of it, is three parts. It means fully embracing the things that matter most to you and not to anybody else. It's the condition of trusting your journey of growth. It is the act of pursuing only the goals that nourish you from the inside out. So I want to bring it back to the bucket and the tree because this bucket it just collects stuff. It's lifeless. This stuff rots, it becomes sewage, it starts to smell bad. Who you are is not the bucket. Who you are is the tree, full of life, love, and energy. The tree grows, it expands, it generates, it creates ecosystems. And the tree realizes that it only has one duty, and that is to become the fullest version of itself so that it can create and empower new life. You must realize that it is your duty 
to become the fullest version of yourself so that you can create a new life. And only then will you realize that you are exactly who you need to be. Don't be the bucket. Be the tree. Thank you. Thank you.